Morning. Now, if that buzzer di didn't make you think Gabriel was coming, it made me second guess my salvation. <laughs> I should be flying with that thing going. All right, if you're going to stand, we're going to sing at your name. It's your name. do better than that. church this morning and we want to welcome all the people who are also joining us online uh, we'd like to uh, remind everybody that uh, we have uh, coming up um, the uh, what was it I saw oh the Awana so we have discipleship training uh, this week and we have uh, Awanas. We are going through the book of Revelation and we do have our, our Awanas and youth ministry that are coming up um, as well. <clears throat> I want to encourage you uh, to think about people that you might invite uh, on Easter Sunday. And I'm not talking about your church friends, I'm talking about your unchurched friends. Uh, we'll, we, when we come to Easter Sunday, that's, you know, one of, there's three, there's three weeks, uh, Sundays that are the most, uh, you know, attended Sundays, and that's Easter, Christmas, and Mother's Day. So, um, you know, people have a tendency to go to church, so think about your unchurched friends and inviting them. Um, after we have our word of prayer this morning, we will go ahead and uh, greet each, each other, uh, dismiss and, you know, greet each other. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for these blessings today. I pray that as we come and as we worship you, Lord, that you would remove all distractions, that you would help us to focus, and that you would help us to remember who you are. Lord, I want to pray many thanks for the blessings of your son Jesus Christ and the fact that you have given us 
eternal life. You have delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light for those who have believed in your son. And Lord, I pray that if there are any here that are lost and need to be saved, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of, the, of your salvation for their lives. We, live all, we lift all this up to you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's greet one another.
may be seated. We're going to dismiss the children at this time for Children's Church and let the choir step down for a moment. Holy ground. 
Heavenly Father, just want to thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you each and every day. But Lord, we especially on Sundays. Lord, that's why you created us to worship you. Lord, I just pray that you be with Tim as he brings us the message this morning. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to receive that message. But most of all, Lord, we want to thank you for dying on that cross for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to do a quick review on the whole idea behind speaking about or preaching through the book of Deuteronomy. The, Moses had commanded that as each king was to come along, he was to rewrite uh, the book of the law. Many believed that it was meant to be uh, a book, the, specifically the book of Deuteronomy, that the king was to write uh, in, his own, in his own handwriting the book of Deuteronomy, and that would be his hand guide on how to rule, how to live his life personally, and how to live his life as the king or whatever um, <clears throat> when it came to uh, his administering his role uh, with the nation of Israel. I also see, or we also see in the book of Deuteronomy, that there is this great amount of intentional parenting that is embedded in the book of Deuteronomy. And, and a lot of us, as, as we uh, got married and began to have children, we began to think, you know, nobody handed me a book that said, this is what dads do. This is what moms do. We were just flying by the seat of our pants. And then you read the book of Deuteronomy, and it talks about intentional parenting and being very specific about what you're doing as a parent and what you're teaching your children and, and why you're raising your children, the goal for your children. And, and to me, it's, it's like the, the trades out there, right? You get, you get a, a prospect and, and then that person comes in or we would say with our children before they're saved, they're a, a prospect for the kingdom of God. And then uh, we do the things that we need to do to model the Christian behavior so that they would become saved. And then once they become saved, they are apprentices and we want those apprentices to become journeymen of life so that when they reach 18, 19, 20 years old, they can go out there and be equipped to be adults, fully equipped to be adults to face the many challenges that they will face in life. And I believe we find a lot of that, obviously the whole Bible is full of that, but we also find a lot of that in the book of Deuteronomy. And we're talking about the Ten Commandments. We're coming up, up on the Tenth Commandment today, and, and we see these as commandments, and, and, and they certainly are. There's ten of them, and each of them are to be taken as an individual command, but they are also ten principles. You see, they're like an umbrella command. And, and when we talk about, uh, for instance, thou shalt not steal, uh, like we did the, uh, uh, the other day, it, was, it wasn't just the idea of stealing, but in that, we believe that there is a, a, a right to private ownership of possessions that God grants us. So it's OK 
okay for me to have a home. It's okay for me to have land. It's okay for me to have automobiles or whatever it is you have. Those up to agree uh, to a degree, right? It's okay to have those things, and it's wrong for someone to come and take them without your permission. Same with the truth. Right? What does the truth do? The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. When we live in truth, guess what? We live in freedom. It's when we live in lying and deception that we live in captivity. So these are things that we see as umbrella. They're not only specific commands, but they're also umbrella principles. And we come to this 10th command, and just like the first command, right? The first command, you could find it maybe translated even differently when we come into Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, when it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind. We come to this command about covetousness. Now, covetousness is not one of those words that we use every day. You know, we don't run around taking our belts off to our kids. You little coveter, you know, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> don't you covet, you know. <coughs> you, when you look at that car over there, don't you covet it, you know. Uh, we, we normally don't do that. As a matter of fact, I think most of us really don't know what to do with this command. And so, <coughs> you know. It is a command that has a direct message to it, but it is also a command that has a broader, it's a principle that has a broader reach than just the command itself. And, and we see that as we come into uh, the follow-on chapters in the book of Deuteronomy, just like with Exodus when the Ten Commandments were originally given to Moses. Those following chapters broke down all sorts of things um, as covetousness. So I want us to understand that covetousness is a real thing. It's a real thing. And what's coming up? You know what's ending? Winter. I don't, you know, I don't do the whole groundhog thing. That's a, you know, <laughs> groundhogs aren't God. Um, but, you know, we have winter, right? And we have winter coming up, and after winter is spring. And what's going on in the retail world right now? It's all these clothes. It's all these clothes. And when you go and buy the clothes, especially the bathing suits, who are you trying to please? Who are you trying to glorify? You know, we, we talk about these things and, and, and going to youth camp, this is one thing, a discussion that we have with the parents in the clothes and, and, um, and the bathing suits and stuff is, is there is a modesty code when we go to these youth camps. And it's like, you know, I, we, we've heard, you know, well, we can't find those clothes in the stores. Well, I see kids that have them. Maybe the best thing to do is go ask those parents where they're finding the clothes, right? What stores do they shop at? But when you go to youth camp, the idea isn't, you know, oh boy, what girl's got the shortest shorts on? It should be, you know, hey, we're there for Jesus, right? So the shorts, you know, go down. They should be beyond, I, I tell you what, moms. Just ask dad if it's acceptable, right? Dads are built in with a radar that says danger, danger, danger. And so, you know what? You, you allow the dad to be a dad and help him set the tone. You know, when it says a one-piece bathing suit, you know, it, it's all about modesty. It's all about modesty. And... Yet, what do we desire when we dress our kids or allow our kids 
to dress, or even ourselves, to dress in modesty. What is it we desire? That's what covetousness is. It's misplaced desire. And I'm going to ask you to stand as we read this 10th commandment. Turn to uh, Deuteronomy 5.21. Deuteronomy 5.21. It says, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for the fact that you communicate guidelines and a framework for us that's designed to build us up. And help us to realize the difference between those things that tear us down and those things that build us up. Lord, everything that we do, we do to be like Jesus. And everything he did was to fulfill your law. And to build us up. So Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would desire to be more like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So when we, we, when we begin to look at this idea, we begin to realize, hey, there are some things that we have going on uh, about covetousness that we have to get right. That, that, that reveals some stuff about us. And the first thing that it does is covetousness reveals our heart. So when I covet... For instance, in this example, there's, there's the negative aspect, you shall not covet, which means the only thing left, right, is to be content with what you have. So covet, covetousness, it, it gives us a couple of things. It are some things here. It says, hey, <clears throat> in this command, I can't covet, you know, my neighbor's wife or any of his belongings. You know, he has a Lexus, I can't covet. That, and we'll get to, to that in, in a sense uh, in, in just a minute. But, but on the positive side, what does it say? What does it mean? I can have a wife or a spouse, as is appropriate. I can have a house. I can have things. I can own possessions. And it's okay for me to own possessions. And not only that, is I can... I can commit myself to work to buy those possessions. I can do that. God, we talk about God's providential care. How does God provide for us? He gives you a job. You go to work. You perform that job at the end of a pay period. You get a paycheck with that paycheck. You go. You pay your house payment. You pay your, uh, your bills. You go to the grocery store. You buy food. You have shelter. You have food. You have everything you need to, su to survive. That's how God provides for you. But covetousness, or in this case, misplaced desire goes, it's not even going beyond that, it's going in contrast to that. It's not that I don't have my stuff, but I want your stuff too. And, and that's the idea here. It's, it's the idea that I am not content with what God has given me. I'm not happy with it. I want more. And, and if we look at Galatians, we see that it is, it is a desire that lusts against the Spirit. Or it's the lust of the flesh that desires against the Spirit. So anything that we desire or we want is if it's in an ungodly way and it's out of context of God's provision and this framework that God has given us, then it's wrong. But it's all about our misplaced desires. Now, desire in and of itself is not a bad thing. Psalm 37, 4. 
Delight yourself in the Lord and he will what? Give you the desires of your heart. Right? We've heard that. We hear those things. But why do we covet? You know, when I took, I think it was marketing. It was the, you know, big overview version. And they said the purpose of marketing is to appeal to the insatiable wants and needs of the consumer. That was written in a book. To appeal to the insatiable wants and needs of the consumer. What do they think? What, what do marketing people think about us? Or what do, you know, and that is that we have insatiable desires. We can't get enough. And that can't, you know, that's, when, when we have that, those things can be true. Is my identity wrapped up in my bass boat? Or is my identity wrapped up, which I don't have one, <clears throat> I don't, and, you know, is my identity wrapped up in the fact that I have a bass boat, a, a travel trailer, or, you know, all these things? Is my identity wrapped up in the fact that I'm carrying around a Louis Vuitton purse with my $15 tennis shoes on? You know, it's these ideas that we think that our identity is found in our possessions or in our status. You know, that's, that's where we get into with kids, the, the whole popularity thing, right? You get into this, you know, every kid wants to be the popular kid at school, and regardless of all the headaches, right? And you know what? Popularity fades. It doesn't stay with you. When you become a popular kid at school and then you go out and you work with a construction crew, you know, they're not going to say, oh, he was the most popular kid in school. He obviously is going to be the best construction worker out here. Let's put him in the most important job. No, it doesn't work like that. If you're lucky, they're going to hand you a shovel. Otherwise, you're going to be picking up a lot of trash and hauling stuff a long way, and you're going to use every part of your physical body that you can imagine. And if you don't realize it, the first day, by the next morning or the third morning, you will fully realize what all muscles you have or don't have because your body will be in lots of pain. I remember <clears throat> going through school. I had attained a lot of popularity and my one of my first jobs was working with pouring slabs. <clears throat> Did they make me the the guy that was, you know, the cement worker that the skilled cement worker that was, you know, uh, fighting everything out? No. Boy, if I'd have taken, uh, I forget what you call it now, but uh, if I'd have taken that and I'd have made that concrete look like a mess. No, I was hauling the forms around and digging the ditches and stuff like that. I, I went from that into working for the city of Dallas sewer department. Guess what they gave me? A shovel. <clears throat> I shoveled when people were flushing. Okay, my popularity in high school got me absolutely nowhere. Now, there is absolutely nothing wrong with those jobs. Don't get me wrong. But I was not the truck driver. I was not the crew chief. So that popularity went away as soon as I graduated high school. And, and the things that happened after that we're all based off of the work, uh, the work effort I put in. I either put in enough work to move up or I didn't. And that's up to the individual. But God has us in a country right now where we can have a great work ethic and get great rewards for, doing, for having a great work ethic. And we can acquire all these things that we think that we need. When in fact, 
We don't need any of it. Or most of it. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You see, our first priority should be the kingdom of God. It's not what we want or what we have. It should be what is it that God wants and what is it that God has for us. What does Paul say? He says, put off stealing, get a job, pay for your own way, and hey, when you have extra, take some of that extra and help the poor. Right? That's one of the things we see that's behind this idea of covetousness. If you have desires, go and work for them. Don't expect someone to hand it over to you. And that doesn't mean, you know, that's within a family unit. You know, that doesn't mean the husbands get to look at the wives and go, yeah. You know, that's, that's not where that's coming from. It is as a family, you're working towards a similar goal. And that goal should be to glorify God and Christ in your life. It reveals our heart. It reveals what's important to us. I think Bland just had their prom. And other schools, you know, this is prom year too. Oh my goodness. You talk about a perfect example of covetousness. There's not one dress that's worth a hundred bucks that most girls want. They'll settle for it. It's not the ones they want, usually. Every one of them they want is at least 500 bucks, right? And how many times are they going to wear it? Once. All right, they're going to wear it to prom they're gonna, or, or whatever. Guys, I don't care. You know, hey, it's prom. I'll, I'll wear it. You know, you just put it on me, I'll wear it. And... But girls, this is, this is like a wedding, almost as bad as a wedding. You know, this is, this is crazy as to how much money they want to spend. But why? Why is that? Why is that? Does that glorify God? Now, there may be a reason it does. I'm not wiping out and denying that there can't be reasons, but what I'm saying is in most cases, especially if you're a family that lives from paycheck to paycheck, is that a good way, good reason to spend that money in that way? You know, where's your heart? The parents get upset if they can't provide it. Where's your heart in that? A heart... Is supposed to be focused. Remember, there are no other gods ex- besides me. Remember the very first command. It goes back up to the first command. There are no other gods besides me. You are not to make yourself an idol. It doesn't matter what other people think. And it's a lie. It's a misconception to think, oh look... This thousand dollar dress is who I am. No, it's not. Oh, maybe it is. Maybe it's a, you're willing to be foolish about it. If you're living, now if you can afford it, hey, knock yourself out. I'm not talking about people that can afford it. I'm talking about when we, I'm talking about wrapping it up as part of our identity. And putting unrealistic expectations of what we get from that. Right? When we identify with our possessions, our possessions hold the wrong value. We need to identify with our possessions in light of God. What did Solomon say when he when he went through the wrote through the book of Ecclesiastes? Everything under the sun, right? Everything the sun being if the sun is your limit, right? Everything is meaningless, including prom, including the swimsuits, 
Everything, in, even including your job. But when we look past the sun and into the S-O-N, the Son of God and His kingdom, and we look at it for His glory, then all things make sense. All things have real purpose. All things come to the point of glorifying Him. And why? Because He is the way that people can have eternal life. It also, covetousness impacts our behavior. It impacts our behavior. We, I just talked about that, right? We'll go out and buy stupid stuff. <clears throat> now, I, I picked on girls, and I'm going to tell you, men, our daughters can't spend a tenth of what we can spend. I have a dear lease, and I can guarantee you, I have more tied up in that dear lease than any of my granddaughters have in prom dresses combined. All right? <clears throat> Model's granddaughter down here. <laughs> <laughs> You better believe it. <laughs> but I'm subduing the earth. That's the reason why I get to do it. <laughs> no, I, I'm, you know, I'm saying, you know, all of us are guilty. We're all caught up. We get caught up in this covetousness. And we got to remember, right, that the desire against the spirit, the lust of the flesh desires against the spirit. It may not just be deer hunting. It may not be just, you know, this or that. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's, you know, whatever the case is. Where is it you're putting God in relation to these things? What is it you're expecting to get out of this? And it's hard. It's a hard thing to deal with and to balance and, and to figure out how to put and make God a priority. How do you get your kid in baseball when they're playing baseball on all day Sundays or all day Wednesdays? How does that work out? And then you have to ask yourself, or football, whatever the sport is, right? Then you, <clears throat> It's baseball season coming up. So, so is baseball worth it? Well, you know what? If your kid is a speed demon and he's a power hitter and, and he's going to be over six foot tall, maybe it is. But if the genetics aren't there, probably not, you know. If you get them wrapped up in basketball and everybody in your family's under six foot, Probably not going to be a professional basketball player. Probably not. Might make it even kind of hard to get into some colleges. You go to Grayson College, and every one of those kids are at least 6'5". And they can move like the wind. And that's the girls. <clears throat> so... So we have to look and we have to see, you know, how does this impact our behavior? When I'm coveting, I will work night and day to get my material possessions under the guise that I'm trying to provide a better life for my family. And I will neglect my family for years as a dad, because what I'm doing is I'm sacrificing my time so they can have all these wonderful wants in life that are so far beyond their needs, it's unbelievable. And instead of meeting the need of a dad in their lives, I replace that need with possessions. It impacts our behavior. It impacts our behavior in the fact that, you know, oh, if my spouse was like oh, so-and-so's spouse, man, life would be 
so much better. Or if my kids behaved like so-and-so's kids, my life would be so much better. Man, if, if we could have a bass boat, I could take my sons out fishing and I could be a better dad. We say these things to ourselves. We say this, and you know what? It's putting God somewhere else other than first. It's putting all these things that are desiring against the Spirit. It's the lust of the flesh that's desiring against the Spirit. And we will spend money... You know, I, I wouldn't say this if I wasn't guilty of it too, you know. So, but we will spend money on some of the most ridiculous things. And then lastly, covetousness brings ruin. You know, it's that desire against the spirit that we gossip about people. And we tear them down. It's that desire against the Spirit that we will lie about people. Do you hear what they did? It's that desire against the Spirit that if we borrow something from someone, we won't return it, knowing that we're stealing it. It is that desire against the Spirit. That in my mind, I can look and have all sorts of evil and horrible thoughts. It's that desire against the Spirit that I can sit there and say, yeah, I want everything for free. It's that desire against the Spirit that will ruin relationships and destroy our lives. It is covetousness that is at the root of sin, right? What did Eve, what did what did Satan say? Man, if you eat from that tree, you're going to be just like God. And what did Eve do? She turned and looked and she saw that tree. And what did she, what does the Bible say? It was desirable for food. It was desirable for good food. Amen. She went and ate. And as Adam was trying to yell at her to stop, she shoved it into his mouth. <laughs> and he, you know, Adam being the big dummy that we men can be, he's sitting there and she hands it to him. And he takes and eats. It's that desire against God. That's what covetousness is. It's not just our actions, guys. People. It's the desires. Jesus said it. If you look at a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already. If you look at your brother and you hate him, you have murdered him already in your heart. How easy is it to get mad at someone and never reconcile? Because we won't bring ourselves to that point. We won't forgive. We'll hold grudges. We'll do everything because why? It's our desire for our own self importance. And it's mistaken, it's wrong. Because God looked at us. In Colossians, it says, we were foreign to Him. 
It calls us foreigners or aliens to Him. We were something He did not recognize. We are at war against Him in our minds. We are evil in our deeds towards Him. And you may think, well, I, I thought I was a pretty good guy. Well, that's not what the Bible, that's not how God sees it. Your truth isn't important. What's important is God's truth. And God sees it as you being alien, as you being at war, and as you being evil. And yet, in spite of all of that, Christ commended His love towards us in that He died so that we could be saved. He took all of our sin. He took all of our guilt. He took all of God's wrath on Himself so that we could be saved. So that we could be forgiven. So that we could call our Heavenly Father, Father. We could call Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. We could call the Holy Spirit our God, our Comforter, our Advocate. We could call God in all three persons, the, the majesty and glory, and lift them up and worship them for who they are. Jesus did that for us. He restored our former glory to us. That was in Adam and Eve before they sinned. And not by anything we did. See, the Bible says that we have to stop running from God. We have to stop and turn to God in repentance. Jesus said, without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sins. And when we turn in repentance, we have to receive what Jesus did for us in faith. We have to believe that Jesus did it for us. We have to believe that what He did, He was able to do. He had the authority to do. And that when He did it, He did it for each and every one of us. When I have repentance, or when I repent, and I turn to God and I ask Him to forgive me of my sins, and I place my faith in Jesus Christ, He did, when He died on that cross, He died for Tim Klein, and when He died on that cross, He died for you. It's on that cross that God's desire that none should be that none should perish that all should know the love of god was exemplified and was brought to reality for all humanity and the ability to have god's forgiveness now exists the ability for us to have a right relationship with god now exists the ability for us to be possessed by the holy spirit and to have the the ability to delight ourselves in the Lord so that He can give us the desires of our heart exists now. Because of what Jesus did. You want a happy and free life? Then you got to get with the truth. You continue to live in a lie that does nothing but tear you down. But when you abide in the truth by abiding in Christ, your life will be everlasting. And you will spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. Now for a lot of us, that's still such a foreign concept, we don't get it. But you know what? The older I get, the more real it becomes. It may not be as real to these young kids as it is to some of us older kids. <clears throat> but for us older kids, it's a reality that we see not too far down the road. Where are your desires? Where are your desires? We're going to have a hymn of invitation. And during this hymn... 
the Bible says, for anyone who wants to be saved, that they have to receive Christ. You receive him, just like I said, by repentance and by faith. And if you want God to save you, you need to tell him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We put a prayer up here for you to look at. And that prayer is, there's nothing magical about the words. It just helps you formulate the words that captures the intent of your heart. And if you're not a Christian and today is the day for your salvation, I ask that you pray that prayer. And you receive Jesus Christ. I ask if you're a Christian and you said, man, my, my desires have been misplaced. But you can get that right. The Holy Spirit will work in you and He can do that in the pew. Maybe you need to get up and talk to someone. Maybe you need to cross the aisles. Maybe you need to come to the prayer altar. But if you're a believer and the Holy Spirit is convicting you, the thing that you need to do is obey the Holy Spirit. And if you're a lost person and the Holy Spirit is telling you today is the day of your salvation, then today you need to ask God to forgive you. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to pray and we're going to have a hymn of invitation.